Uh, hey guys, thanks for doing this. Um, Shane, just a general one to kind of start us off with uh, to get us going, I guess. What, what do you think are the, the strengths and, and weaknesses of this class? How do you kind of view the, the group as a whole going in? Yeah, I think broadly it's a it's a deep class. I think if you look around, you know, the different demographics, there's there's depth definitely in the position player side. Um, you know, I think the college the college position players and high school high school position players, there's going to be some depth to kind of give some length to to those day one picks. Uh, and then it's a bit of a unique situation, I guess, for you guys this year with, with not having a second round pick. Um, how does that kind of just the gap between your, your first round selection and your third? How did how did that impact your kind of preparation for this draft? Did it did it impact it at all just with the separation that you have? Yeah, it's it's certainly different, but also familiar. Um, 2021, we also didn't have a second round pick. Um, so it gave us kind of a good idea uh, on what to expect and maybe how to better use our time. Uh, this year using our resources and our manpower and, and kind of scheduling our looks a little differently throughout throughout the country. Cool. Thanks, Shane. Appreciate it. Hey, Shane, thank you for uh, for doing this with us today. That um, With the lack of a second rounder, does that allow for more freedom, uh, more uh, appetite for risk when it's coming to uh, you know, financial aspects of the draft high up? No, I don't think so. I don't. I don't think your appetite for risk really changes given the the bonus pool or or you know the number of picks that you hold in a given year. You know, our our process remains the same to to get the best player available in in each round and and stay committed and and disciplined to, to the work that we do in the week leading up to the draft and you know all the work that we're doing you know a, a full calendar year before too. We spend a lot of time getting to know these players and and want to be disciplined and, and stay committed to the information that we have. And after the, uh, you know, a very busy year scouting and, and traveling and, and such, what are these last couple of weeks uh, like? Is this, uh, you know, finalizing rankings? Like what goes into these final weeks leading up uh, the busy part of your schedule for the draft? Yeah, given given the late draft now, it, it allows us to kind of take a step back, really, really consume the information and, and poke holes in our own process, tie up some loose ends, uh, do a little bit more one-on-one -on -one meetings with players and dig a little bit deeper. Um, so that, that's been kind of the biggest adjustment, obviously spending some time scouting college summer leagues like Cape Cod or the draft league, uh, and then also the, the MLB combine as well, which was out in Phoenix this year. So we're using, we're using our, our non game time a little bit, a little bit differently. Um, but it's uh, it's been good so far. I appreciate it, Shane. Go ahead, Jay. Thanks, Rod. Uh, hey, Shane. Uh, hope all's well, man. Uh, I'm wondering, in terms of a process or from a process perspective, uh, has over the past few years with the gains in player development, has the scouting process and the types of player you target perhaps changed uh, with uh, you know, some of the things that you guys have learned about developing players, do you guys maybe target different skills or different sets because that's what player development says we can better leverage? Yeah, I think ultimately that's the goal to feed your system with, with the types of players that you're best at developing. Um, I, I think what we're trying to do is, is really involve our player development group specifically, you know, at the coordinator level, fold them into our uh, amateur scouting process a little bit more throughout the year, get them familiar with the pool of players they may potentially be working with. Um, and it also allows a different set of eyes uh, to look at the player differently than a traditional scout may. Uh, so it provides a unique opinion, um, identifies some potential hurdle, hurdles or, um, you know, different uh, development levers to pull on if, if we do if we do acquire the player. And has the type of player you, you target changed because of some of that input in terms of, uh, you know, player development, say these are the traits that we see and that maybe that changes your scouting views on certain certain skills and certain abilities? At times, um, but you do have to, to take what the draft is, is giving you. Um, you know, I think if you look at our, our drafts over the last few years, they've been uh, fairly diverse or balanced in some ways. You can look at last year's draft with uh, players like Alan Roden or Josh Kaspich who controlled the zone well, made a lot of contact. And then, you know, a few rounds later, we take a chance on Peyton Williams, who has, uh, he's more, you know, 
corner first base profile with really big power. So, um, you know, we are, you know, we're a little bit more balanced, but obviously trying to trying to get the players in, in our system that our player development group is most wanting to most wanting to work with. And the last thing, just from, uh, again, from what you guys have learned over the past few years, uh, what skills or sort of raw tools have you found are most successfully developed in a player, player uh, once a player gets into the system, as in, you know, if you see this being really raw, this is really something that your player development people can work with? Uh, I think an area we've, we've attacked well is really on the physical development side with our strength and conditioning and, and nutrition. I think. Uh, you can point to Ricky Tiedemann as somebody we saw pretty immediate gains with, um, you know, just getting him a, a, a more diligent routine and, and program in place uh, for him and to really take off. And a lot of that was done you know, just based on physical gains. All right. Thanks. Your turn, Mitch. Hey, Shane, thanks for the time. I uh, had a similar few questions there to Shai, but maybe just on the hitting side, a similar question. You mentioned Kasovich and Roden. Would you feel that kind of approach is the trait that you guys have identified most that you're best at developing from those guys? Uh, I think it has been, but, you know, that's an ongoing process. It's something we're always looking at and open open to, uh, you know, adjusting along the way. I think contact is something we certainly, certainly value. The, the pitching only gets better and strikeouts, uh, go up, you know, on, on the way to, up to the big leagues. So, um, yeah, identifying players with good contact skills and abil ability to manage the zone is is a is a you know really really big indicator for us. And then just on the combine, how has that from this kind of process changed how you guys work or what you guys are learning about these pro uh, these prospects? Yeah, it allows us to get a room and sit face to face. I, I think that's the biggest advantage uh, of going to the combine. Um, just getting to be, you know, one on one or or in a, you know, in a small group and get to know, get to know more about the player, more about their their development path up to this point, um, you know, and things like that. So it's been really beneficial. Yeah, you're up, John. Uh, thanks for making the time, Shane and, and uh, Rod and Adam for setting this up for us. Uh, my first question for you, Shane, is real easy. Whereabouts are you right now? <laughs> we are in Toronto. We've been meeting for a few days here, so I think we started on on Sunday. Um, so we got a few more days leading up to the draft, but uh, it's been it's been good to be back in Toronto. Cool. And uh, my second question is, what would you say is the biggest need that the Blue Jays are trying to address in this upcoming draft? I don't think we're trying to address any any specific needs in the draft. Um, just given the volatility of, of prospects at this age and this level, I think we're really just focused on on trying to acquire the best player possible. Cool, man. Thanks. All right, and Caitlin. Hey, Shane. Um, thanks for your time. Uh, just wondering, in terms of like makeup, you you guys always talk about that. I wondered, like. Are there certain traits that you as the organization try to identify in guys, not so much the skill set, but sort of the personality and what they can bring on that side? I think what we're really trying to identify is just what type of routines and, and maturity level are they walking in with on day one? It's not about a yes or no. It's more so about what do we have to support them with and, and how advanced are they? You know, the the 21 year old college player at a major program is going to walk in with a different understanding of what he needs to do to get himself prepared to play a, a full season in the minor leagues, as opposed to the 17 or 17 or 18 year old high school prospect. Um, so really trying to, to learn more about their, their work ethic, their work habits, uh, their ability to handle failure is really important. Um, those are kind of the things we're really keying up on. Awesome. That's it for me. Thank you.